grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I've been in ministry for 13 months now. And now that I am not my first year, I think I would have experience with my belt to tackle the single most difficult text for a Lutheran pastor to preach on. This would be the letter of St. James, the brother of Jesus. For he says very clearly in our text, in our epistle for today, verse 17, the following. So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. I'll repeat that. So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. This is a problem. Because it appears on the face value that, that scripture has a fatal contradiction. Because we're all familiar with Ephesians 2.8 where it says, It is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, lest anyone boast. So, uh-oh, Ephesians says this, and James says this. And it looks like they're on a collision course, and then they panic these give then statements. Well, then scripture has contradictions and is unreliable. Yet, then how do we know anything about our faith? If that's true, you know, if we know nothing, why are we even in this building? Why am I up here doing this? We might as well walk out and not bother coming back. But before we start panicking about this, let's take a moment, take a breath, and analyze the letter of James in its proper context. Context, of course, is key. Notice who James is writing to. Is he writing to a group of new believers? And is he penning a practical statement of Christian doctrine? No. He's writing to veteran believers, people who have been in the faith for years, for decades even, and have already been catechized on what the faith is. Rather, James is using the literary form known as hyperbole, using uh, extreme language to make a rhetorical point. And also, what fire is James wanting to put out? That really gives things away. James is addressing a situation he has seen happen over and over and over again. As Jesus' brother, another child of Mary and Joseph, James has been on board with the Christian faith since his brother rose from the dead in 33 AD. And he sees again the same thing happen over and over again with Paul or some missionary coming to a city. And they preach the gospel. And the people gladly hear it and come to faith. And for a time, they are on fire. They live their life according to their faith. But with the daily grind of life, after months and years, people slowly but surely become more lukewarm. Because they have a seed planted in the back of their mind. And they figure, you know what? No matter what, God forgives me. I'll have eternal life. This is most certainly true. But this truth of the gospel gets twisted with, you know what? I can live life however I want. I don't need to feel guilty or worry about it, because no matter what, I'm covered. And people kind of get excited that realize, you know what? Maybe I better take a step back from that. But still, that seed is planted in the back of their mind. And over time, it slowly grows and grows and grows like a cancer until finally it metastasizes into outright indifference. People figure, yeah, I'm saved. So what difference does it make how I live my life here? I'm saved no matter what. And James has seen, has seen this happen way too many times. He knows that when indifference sets in, when our Lord and Savior Jesus Jesus Christ stops being Lord and Savior and becomes fire insurance. At that moment, faith is lost. It's not immediate. It works insidiously over time. But when people stop caring and see it as a license to do whatever they like, their faith is gone. And James has seen this happen way too many times. So he takes a stand against it, urging people, faith without works is dead. Not a literal statement about having earned your salvation by good works, rather a reminder. If you truly have that faith in saving faith, the good works will follow. Not as proof, not as a uh, part of salvation, but as evidence that the saving faith is there. Because James knows the game Satan's playing. 
You know, some people come to the gospel and they're washed away of their sins. That they're all loved by God. That Satan can't touch them. So he says, hey, come back to the mud pit. And he tells people to go back and dip in the mud. Then go back to the gospel. And you know, the more they double dip and go back and forth, and they might initially cling to the gospel, the more they double dip, the less tightly they cling. The more they take it for granted. So eventually his game is to get them to be indifferent and to stop caring. James argues against this by being so law-orientated, by emphasizing so much what God expects of us. Because James knows irony is in full effect. The more you cling to the gospel without any kind of balance of the law of what God expects of you, the less valuable the gospel becomes until it becomes worthless. Rather, James balances out with the law. He knows the law is good. He knows the law is what is God's word to us. And it's there to remind us that we need the gospel. The law is there to show us our sin, get us to cling to the gospel all the more. Because he knows with the law gone, so eventually the gospel will also be gone. And you've seen it too many times. So we hear this and figure, okay, James, we're on board. We're not children here. We can accept you know, a nuance to our faith. It's not all about, you know, answering head knowledge. We get it. Do the right thing. All right, so we yet again become comfortable with James. And so yet again, again, James makes us uncomfortable by not staying in the abstract, but instead getting into the concrete of everyday life. You see, just like our world today, with our haves and our have-nots, James's world had a social pecking order as well. At the top, you had the emperor, and just beneath him, you had the government of the senators and governors and so on. And then you had the wealthy publicans, people who had money. Then you had the many plebeians, people who didn't have money. And at the bottom, you had the slaves, people who had nothing. Just like today, seemingly. And just, but as the gospel spread, people from all walks of life in Roman society came to faith. And then, you know, uh, classism and favoritism reared its ugly head. Which James calls out in verse 9, saying, But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And this admonition is followed up in verse 10, which says, Whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become guilty of all of it. So with saying this, James succeeds in putting us all into full on panic. There's open times in our lives where we judge, and we've judged harshly on appearances. There's always been times in our life where, not just times in our life, on a daily basis, where I struggled with sin, where you have struggled with sin, where we know what we should have done, but chose not to do it anyway. And God knows this. God knows that we are sinners. So with that, our last sense of smugness and moral superiority is stripped away. We know that we're not better than those people. We're the same sinners as everyone else. In fact, it's worse. As the Apostle Paul said, chief of sinners though I be, no, we're the chief of sinners. We have to acknowledge that we have no right to be in God's presence, and that, that if life was in any way fair, we'd be forever cast out from it. Yeah, at this point we're panicking. We're calling it anything, anything that can give us comfort. And then we get to, hey, hey, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, and then we cling to it. For we know in the gospel, Jesus is similar to a naive judge or a naive jury. He knows that, uh, that our life is kind of a, a legal case. The evidence is our daily life of how we sin. And how we should know better, but we still do it. And so our daily lives remains a series of well-instructed, well profound arguments that Jesus should just leave us alone. That when Pilate washes hands of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ should wash his hands of us. Because we'll take his mercy and grace for granted. We'll just do it again. And Jesus is like that judge or jury who hears all of this and still says, you know what? I'll give them another chance. I'll say not guilty. And that's shocking. Not guilty again? Yeah, Jesus says, not guilty. 
And Jesus isn't doing this as an abstract. He knows full well what this is going to cost him. And Jesus, to make this, uh, to affect this not guilty verdict, came from heaven to a manger. From a manger to being a refugee. From a refugee to being a carpenter, to being a rabbi, and then things get nitty gritty. Someone that's betrayed. Someone that's thrown to the uh, Roman Empire. And there I'll spare you the gory details. Let's just say that when he died, it was a mercy. From heaven to all of this. And then Jesus really goes 180. He goes down to hell itself and tells Satan, by the way, these people that you had in your front pocket, the people that were hooked on you, no more. They're mine. They're forgiven. Now please pardon me. And with that, Jesus is back again in the empty tomb alive again, knowing he will soon ascend back to heaven. And this is for people, you and I, that Jesus knows at some point will take him for granted. And he knows we'll go back to our sinful life. He is so loving. He is so forgiven. Even that is not enough to get him to turn aside. His love for us is so deep, that's so profound. Even daily falling back into sin, even daily rational rationalizations and ignoring Jesus are not enough to get him to turn away from us. That's how deep his love is. But the old song, Deep and Wide, Jesus' love isn't just deep, it's wide, it is massive. This mercy that Jesus Christ has for us on a daily basis isn't just ours. It's for the entire creation, the entire planet, everyone who has ever lived. Jesus Christ, his death has turned to life. His mercy is for them as well. That's how deep and wide the gospel is. So we see it in just the cosmic scale of the gospel. You know, we are dumbfounded. Our jaws are drop. <coughs> so James says, faith without works is dead. We can't argue with them. Something that amazing, that cosmic, you can't experience it and go back to life the way it was before. It changes you at the very core of your being. And it is a profound heart change. In a moment, in today, it does not make you sinless. You will still struggle. But at least at this point, it is a struggle. You are trying your best to love God and love your neighbors. And uh, you're trying your best. And so if you have faith, those works are going to come naturally. So at once, and finally, in dealing with all of this, it looks like we're good with James. But James wouldn't be James with just one more little reminder. For James says, verses 14 through 16, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What well, good is that? The obvious answer is that it's no good at all. That's not saving faith. Now, certainly as a pastor, I can't order anyone around. I can't say give 100 bucks to Salvation Army, give 200 bucks to UNICEF. I can't. I don't know you. I don't know your situation. But you know you. You know your situation. You know people in your life, even that you in this region of the country are struggling to get by. You know what you're capable of giving and what's beyond reach. And I leave it there. I know, because the gospel is preached, I know you're God's children. I know you have faith in the Holy Spirit's there. <clears throat> and I leave it there. You know people who need help. You've got the resource. And I simply remind us that yes, we are God's children. Yes, faith without works is dead. And so since we have faith, the works will result. So I stand here confident because of God's grace, because of Jesus Christ, because of the Holy Spirit, the needs of the poor brother and sister whom Christ has died for will be met. For God is God, and His will will be done. Faith without works is dead. Good thing we do have faith, so the works will flow naturally. Amen.